So we're talking today with the distinguished British philosopher Roger Scruton about his splendid new book, How to Think Seriously About the Planet, The Case for Environmental Conservatism. And, and Roger, I want to begin this way. Um, it, it's too difficult to summarize this very rich, detailed book in a short video. Uh, but why don't you just tell us uh, for a moment about how you came to be interested in writing a book about the environment for conservatives. Well, I, I've for a long time thought that the confiscation of the environmental problems and the environmental agenda by people on the left is quite illegitimate, that really it should be a conservative cause and always has been. Uh, and I, I think that uh, one needs to understand the environmental uh, movement as the latest version of something that's been around for an awful long time, for say, well, perhaps from the beginning of history, but at least in our civilization for two or three hundred years, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and if you look at conservative thinking and conservative philosophy over the last two or three hundred years, you will see that it's been perfectly adapted to understanding this kind of problem. Uh, for, uh, for example, Burke's uh, famous reformulation of the social contract as a contract between generations which includes the dead and the unborn um, on which he based his entire conception of society and his opposition to the French Revolution opens itself immediately to a conception of politics as a long-term thing in which the, the care for the environment is a fundamental uh, feature. So, in other words, uh, we see another application of Burke's splendid phrase about little platoons. Well, there is that too, that's a, a, that Burke, like in, in opposing the French revolutionaries, he was opposing the top-down system of political decision-making and asking us to find the real social motives of real people. Not, uh, let's say, not the kind of people who agitate and form uh, dictatorial elites, but people like you and me, who when they have a problem, get together and try and solve it. Right. That leads uh, to my main question, which is about the central idea of the book, which you call oikophilia. Would you describe oikophilia for me? Right. Well, uh, this is obviously uh, derived from the Greek, the love of the oikos. Uh, I, I, want, I want to put that concept in the center of environmental thinking. Uh, the, the oikos for the uh, ancient Greeks was not just the home, um, although we get our word economy from, uh, from this uh, Greek word. The oikos was the entire settlement of which one was a, is a part uh, includes the home, but it includes the, hu the, the social relations, uh, the sense of, of belonging which comes with the home, and all those motives that go into defending it and maintaining it from, for one's successors uh, and, for the, and for their children too. So I wanted to put this motive back in the centre of the environmental agenda because it seems to me that it is the the primary motive for, for, from which people do things and make sacrifices for the sake of, uh, of the common good and also for, for the sake of the enduring environment of which they're trustees. Right. The book came out uh, in Britain several months ago under a different title, Green Philosophy, and mm -hmm. I think uh, in some of the other Commonwealth countries like Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, my perception from afar was that it was well reviewed and well received in Britain. Uh, could you talk a little bit about what reaction you've gotten over in, uh, in other countries so far? Uh, the reaction in England was positive, and I th uh, partly because it touches on something very dear to the English, which is their love of, of the country, their love of the, uh, of the place, the island home, uh, and their, the growing sense that we are uh, um, uh, uh, destroying it through overpopulation, migration, uh, and the, the modern forms of industrial pollution. And I think that there's a very serious need in England to revisit those great uh, environmentalists of the 19th century, like like Ruskin and, and William Wordsworth and, and people like that, who, who gave us this sense of the preciousness of our landscape and the fact that it must be uh, preserved for future generations. Well, let me ask one last uh, tough question, you might say, uh, which is uh, how that uh, tradition and, and way of thinking, which I'm familiar with and, and deeply admire, whether or how well it translates to America, where we are rootless, right? Mm -hmm. Americans move constantly. The average American household moves every five years or something like that, mm -hmm. and we move all over the country. I've lived in all three time zones, all four time zones in the country, for yes. example. So I'm kind of typical. And yes. So I, I wonder if uh, the more rootedness of European cultures and populations is somehow different from the American one, or, or what, what Americans should learn, I guess, from yes. you? Well, I, I do take this very seriously, 
in the book, uh, the, the, the difference between the American and the European approach to things. The fact is, of course, that Europe has been settled for 2,000 or more years with very precious, fragile habitats which people have got into the habit of preserving, including human habitats. And this is shown in our cities, which compared with yours, despite the Second World War and all the bomb bombing, our cities are still roughly intact, whereas here they are devastated zones because people move on. You know, if the, the industry dies, they don't bother to, to, uh, to find another use for it or to, or to um, uh, you know, uh, gentrify any neighborhood. They just build something somewhere else. Now, I have to say that there are quite a lot of Americans who think that this is a huge environmental problem, who follow people like uh, James Howard Kunstler and, mm -hmm. in, in th saying that this can't go on forever, we've got to settle down. But I would say rather that, that um, there is a positive side to this, which is the American love of wilderness and the desire of Americans to protect the wild parts of their continent and to make, that, make those parts into seriously self-reproducing zones which are environmentally relatively pure. The downside is of course the um, degradation of the urban settlement. Uh, uh, but I think, uh, well I, st I hope anyway, that despite your mobility you are getting into the habit of thinking of cities as actually nice places to live if only we attended to them. <laughs> right, right. Well Roger, thanks very much for spending a few minutes with me. Uh, congratulations on this book and I hope it's just the beginning I have a long conversation of, of a way that you brought to the issue that is uh, quite new and original and fresh. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.